In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. One of the things that for anybody that's new to the space and they hear this for the first time, I think it's eye opening. Blockstream has satellites in space that are broadcasting the blockchain that anybody can set up a, a satellite receiver on, on the ground and tap into this feed that's being transmitted by one of the six satellites that are going around the earth. I'm assuming that you guys are licensing this bandwidth off of these satellites. These aren't like, you know, you don't own the satellites. You're just licensing a certain portion of the bandwidth that's coming off. I don't suspect it's a lot of bandwidth. So the cost isn't like if you're streaming video, right? But talk to me about the ROI, Blockstream's ROI for something like this. Right. So I think it comes down to it's augmenting the Bitcoin network. So the, the biggest benefit to the network of there being these Bitcoin satellites in space is that you can prevent network splits. So if an undersea cable is cut to some country or region, and there's a, a decent amount of hashing power there, you can potentially be split off from the rest of the network, and you might say a transaction is valid when it's not. But if, as long as one person in that region is running a blockstream satellite dish, then they can keep that whole area in sync with the rest of the network. And I think that's valuable, especially when we are spending and investing so much money in building on top of Bitcoin. If there are splits in the network, that will impact your peg in transactions on Liquid. That'll impact a lot of things like uh, Lightning. And if we have securities issued on the Liquid network, that will impact those too. So we want to make sure we're stable all through the entire stack. And that is the main benefit. But for, oh, well, actually, it benefits everyone else too. So a lot of people don't understand how all the different parts of what we're working on at Blockstream, um, how they all fit together. But you can also use the Blockstream satellite service for mining. So if you have access to cheap power in some place with uh, poor internet or even no internet, let's say there's a solar farm installation in the desert, there's no internet. You can still mine there. Uh, you can broadcast the block you find uh, over a cell phone signal and you can get the entire Bitcoin blockchain through satellite. So the cool thing is we've recently upgraded to Blockstream Satellite version 2.0. With this version, you can go into the middle of the desert, set up a dish, download the entire Bitcoin blockchain from the Genesis block without any internet and sync, keep in sync with the Bitcoin network through this service. So that's actually really cool. So it opens up the door for mining in various parts of the world that you probably would not consider mining in previously. And this is really important because you can tap into energy sources that mm -hmm. are very low cost that weren't being tapped into and being used in a productive manner that now you can. All right. We're, we're getting near the end here. And I, I'm real curious about this one. So simplicity. This is simplicity is code. It's not a lot of code. It's actually just a couple lines. And it assists in making Bitcoin non turing complete. Tell us why that's important. Right. So simplicity is a smart contracting language, and it is a very, very low level. So the entire language will fit onto the back of a t-shirt. And we actually have t-shirts in our store with the simplicity on it. But uh, what it does is it allows for smart contracts in Bitcoin. It won't be the same as, say, smart contracts in other protocols where they, they have a lot of complex logic, but it allows you to do very powerful things. So you can create vaults. Uh, limit orders, and you can do asset-based lending. So lending, I don't know, USDT for another asset. This is important because it, it adds more functionality to Bitcoin, but it's still not very accessible yet. We're working on some ways to basically get it into the hands of end users. And one of these avenues is with Miniscript. So the idea is that you can compile Miniscript. It's a Bitcoin um, scripting language uh, into uh, Bitcoin opcodes and then also into Simplicity as well. So it just makes Bitcoin more powerful. Things like uh, vaults. So a vault is, I guess the best analogy is a vault. You can put your Bitcoin into this vault. And when you devault it, there's a time period and somebody can cancel the devaulting. So if uh, you're using, I, I guess, like, uh, let's say a Bitcoin multisig to store funds for your company, you can have someone externally cancel the devaulting in case there was a security incident. Like, let's say, Someone compromised it and they got your employees took two of the three of the keys and they can withdraw from the vault. Well, somebody else could stop that withdrawal process from happening. So that, that's an important part of how we can evolve 
the security model of Bitcoin. The other thing is limit orders. So right now, atomic swaps in the Liquid network, it's like the, either the atomic swap is executed or it's not executed. So an atomic swap is where there is a, a trade that happens all at once or not at all. So it's like Bitcoin for Liquid UCT, and it just swaps and then that's it. But with limit orders, you can do a partial atomic swap, so to say. So I think simplicity just opens the door for a lot more cool things you can do with Bitcoin. But for the average user, I think it's still some ways away. But it is there and it is coming. And I, I just want to highlight at the start of this conversation, Samson told you he's not an engineer and, and all, that, all that kind of stuff. So I think I'm proving you wrong that although you might not quote unquote be an engineer, <laughs> I think we, we got pretty engineer -y there for a little bit. The Blockstream, Blockstream engineers would tell you that I've got it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.